Okay, let's let's uh, let's move on to Spoonbill Sandpiper and a return to uh, the, 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 this wonderful story of research being done on this critically endangered species. So you can right. see uh, you can see presentation and hear me. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Just check, double checking myself. Uh, so today will be our um, uh, second uh, lecture or second uh, story uh, about Spoonbill Sandpiper, one of the most unique um, birds in the world and one of the most rare birds in the world, which is breeding in Russia and migrating to Southeast Asia and China. I remind you some uh, points from the first lecture, uh, or you can also um, uh, see it uh, on a Facebook. Um, so this is, um, uh, this is our presentation plan. Uh, so first lecture, I gave an introduction and general information about Spoonbills and Piper. Uh, today, I will um, tell about studying and conservation Spoonbills and Piper in breeding grounds in Chukotka. And um, a third lecture will be about um, our um, uh, study and conservation of Spoonbills and Piper and our waders along the flyway. Uh, so, uh, again, some pictures from the first lecture. Uh, so, Spoon Wilson Piper, how it looks like with its remarkable spoon bill, uh, spoon shape <laughs> bill. Uh, and this is a very rare species, critically endangered uh, and um, um, included in all possible red data books uh, and on the list of 100 most threatened uh, living beings in the planet. Um, why it happened? Because uh, during the last um, 40 years, it was a decreasing of population number of Spoonbills and Piper, uh, which, breed, which um, bring the species to the edge of extinction. Uh, and we assume the main reason for these are habitat change in non-breeding grounds and hunting or trapping in non-breeding ground. Uh, and also a very low breeding success, breeding of legend success in the breeding grounds in Chukotka. So this is the, the map. Um, Spoonbills and Piper is a breeding endemic species um, uh, of the northern part of the Russian Far East. Here you can see on the map. And, um, <clears throat> but the um, most part of the, co uh, of the uh, breeding range of Spoonbills and Piper uh, is um, um, also declining with this um, declining of the number and uh, now we can um, uh, find breeding uh, bird um, uh, in, in more or less good numbers only around Minopilgina settlement. Uh, good number it uh, means uh, just uh, several pairs uh, sometimes from 10 to 20. So this for Spoonbills and Piper is a really good number. Um, and um, the um, so named the capital of Spoonbills and Piper. It's um, the local settlement in Chukotka uh, with unpronounceable name even for Russians. It's named Maino Pilgino. Uh, and it's a local Chukchi settlement uh, with um, mm, uh, helicopter and boats instead of roads and many brown bears around, but quite modern houses, as you can see on the photo. Um, Maina Pulgina uh, was uh, discovered by our expedition organized by Evgeny in 2001 uh, and since uh, 2003 uh, this area become the key monitoring site for Spoonbills and Piper population um, and um, uh, research. And on the top uh, picture you can see our um, monitoring plots um, for uh, comparability of the results of monitoring. Uh, in um, 2001 and 2003, we found um, something like 70 or 80 breeding pairs in the territory. Uh, and the nearest nest was um, in 300 meters from the houses uh, of the village. But later, the number of breeding spoonbills and pipe rapidly declined till uh, 2007, uh, when it was one of the lower number. And um, then it's more or less stabilized, um, uh, we believe at least partly due to our conservation efforts. Um, and uh, we even have uh, uh, the population number slightly growing until um, the two last years when we again uh, have some decline in, in number and only from 10 to 16 breeding pairs for the last season. Um, <clears throat> every year we have an international team working in our um, um, 
uh, group uh, an expedition on uh, different projects and um, we all have scientists and immatures um, and um, the, um, <clears throat> Uh, the, you can see photo from different years. And um, we also um, managed to work this year. We're in the mess and we are missing a lot of our foreign colleagues who help us a lot in our um, research work, but we hope they can join us next year and we can work again together uh, as we did before. Uh, this is um, a list uh, of uh, our scientific activities mm, uh, in our expedition. Uh, you can see it's monitoring of key breeding sites and studies on predation and the uh, call of legend and ringing program, head starting program, and I will mm, explain it later what it is. Uh, then uh, also education work and planning of protected areas um, and many other um, things to do. Uh, Spoonbills and Piper uh, breed, uh, only breed on spits uh, near the coast, um, uh, not further than six kilometers from the coast, uh, on the um, lagoons and in moraine hills in vicinity. And you can see how this territory uh, mm, looks like in uh, our spring, our Arctic spring. This is the end of May uh, when the bird uh, arrive for, for their um, breeding territories and also ornithologists um, um, arrive at the same time, try to be the same time. And this after usually two weeks, the territory changed, the most of snow uh, melted and um, uh, this is uh, how territory uh, looks like ready for the um, beginning of the incubation. And in this time of the year, it's very difficult to use any kind of um, uh, transport because it's still the time is very wet. Um, and um, so we mostly start our excursion by foot. Uh, their conditions, breeding conditions can be very different from one year to year. Um, you can see, for example, in some pictures uh, how the same bush, the same territory uh, looks like um, in a wet and in dry season. And it makes some difference for the location of the nests. Uh, with this picture, you can uh, see how um, it's difficult to find the nest. If anybody can see it, maybe you can point it. But usually people um, answered me that uh, all um, important things are the middle of the photo. So try to see the nest in the middle. Uh, this is the nest. Uh, and um, uh, with the four eggs, um, uh, this, this time it's three eggs, but usually four. Uh, and uh, but uh, uh, it's only um, only for humans difficult to find the nest. Uh, all um, uh, predators can make it very easy, and we have a special project um, with um, um, automatic cameras near the nest. Of course, we put these cameras not near the nest of spoonbills and piper, but near um, nest of other waders, not so rare. And then we have um, interesting results and the photo gallery with the predators. As you can see, it's a common raven, uh, ground squirrels, uh, red fox, arctic skewer, sandhill crane, and of course, brown bear and um, domestic dogs. <clears throat> but all these make um, the success of um, incubation quite low. So uh, usually one pair, um, uh, produce less than one fledgling per year uh, per, per breeding season and it's very low uh, success it's low um, digits uh, so to um, avoid the predation pressure and to increase the productivity of local breeding population uh, um, we started um, our international conservation program which named head starting uh, it is an initiative um, uh, of um, WWT and IRSPB from UK, together with um, a Russian colleague. Uh, and so every year we collect something like 30, um, 30 eggs from the nests and then uh, raised the chick in semi-captive conditions. And this project um, uh, it's more, it's five times time more effective um, um, producing the um, chicks than in nature because it's helped us to avoid the um, predation. 
And this is how the stages um, of the project looks like. So people collected eggs from the nest, put them into incubator, raised them in incubator and the first uh, two weeks in indoors. Uh, and then built the special aviary, you can see it in the middle, um, put um, chicks there and um, uh, raise them uh, in this aviary until they start flying and ready for migration. Uh, people um, provide, take care of chicks uh, and provide them um, additional food supplies. Um, so you can see how they're growing and then go out. And this is how this um, looks like from the bird eye. This aviary is situated on the bank of the big lake, um, uh, one arrow. Uh, and another arrow shows the uh, old um, um, caterpillar, um, uh, which became a home for uh, those people who take care of chicks. And um, I would say that it's um, 20 hour uh, duty because um, they need to, to watch chicks um, every minute, first when they're very small, um, and then uh, they need to protect them from, um, from predation and uh, uh, also try to um, adapt for them uh, some um, natural conditions. And this is the um, timing of young spoonbills and piper, uh, how they um, uh, what is their timetable in nature and uh, usually um, the, um, the last observation of um, uh, fledging is on uh, mid of August. This is how this old caterpillar looks like and um, how people uh, who take care of spoonbills and piper chicks, um, they are wearing their uh, special white costumes to be unlike from other uh, normal people, which um, spoonbills and piper uh, possibly can met in, in uh, their life. And these are the results in digits. So uh, this project started in 2012 uh, and uh, since we have um, more than 200 chicks released in nature uh, and this is a, a very good result. Uh, and these chicks, um, they're all individually marked and they're often seen um, on migration and wintering areas in uh, seven countries of their flyaway and um, wintering areas. And um, what is uh, um, uh, also very important and interesting result for us that uh, so birds not only find their way to uh, winter, uh, winter in area and migration, uh, but they also find their way back. So they came back uh, to Chukotka for breeding. Uh, so this is sightings of uh, these head started chicks on uh, migration and wintering areas. Uh, and you can see individual uh, ring. And this is a life story of some birds, for example, uh, 08 from the stage of egg and then to the stage of an adult bird, which breeding uh, in the territory uh, where it was born. And this is another successful story. Uh, this, uh, this, pair, uh, this pair is um, both uh, consist of uh, head started chicks, which come back to Chukotka, met each other, and um, uh, so they managed to raise a um, chick successfully. So they can do it. Uh, as you can see from this graph, uh, this project made a very good addition to the wild population. Uh, they had, st had started chicks shown with a um, bright blue color. Uh, and uh, so we, we assume it is um, a lot of um, efforts and they are very good for, um, for populations, uh, for this local population size. We also have a um, um, program all, uh, on ringing and color marking wild spoonbills and pipe. We started from just um, uh, green uh, flags, uh, but uh, then uh, from 2011, um, we started to use uh, this um, uh, individual engraved uh, ring, which is very um, good visible uh, in migration and wintering areas. And um, so we also um, often met um, uh, birds which were marked uh, in China, for example, or in Korea and in other territories in Chukotka. And uh, in uh, 2017, uh, we started um, um, uh, also satellite pageant program. Uh, 
with a lot of help of our colleagues from UK, especially Dr. Nigel Clark and Professor Rhys Green. Uh, so this was possible because uh, the company uh, produced um, the smallest um, satellite tags um, in the world, um, which uh, weighed only 1.6 gram, this microwave telemetry. Uh, and so we started using it for spoonbills and pipe. Um, and we mark them both in China and in Chukotka. Uh, as a result, we have um, uh, more than 20 new stopover locations uh, discovered with the help of these satellite uh, tags uh, and um, some new areas um, uh, which was, wasn't known before, in, for example, in North Korea and um, even in Indonesia. Uh, we have um, a lot of um, awareness work in local villages uh, and try to make some kind of educational um, uh, lectures in local school, except this year, of course, because we were not allowed to come to local people this year and uh, try to, to stay on pure nature, on birds and everything. But um, uh, usually we invite um, children um, to see uh, how we are working, especially when um, we re release um, chicks uh, of Spoonbills and Piper um, uh, from um, Head Starting Project, so they come and watch them. And also um, we try to involve local children in um, any kind of international activity. Uh, and um, for um, also for children and for adults, we um, uh, organized the exhibition about Spundus and Piper in Anadir, which is capital of Chukotka. Try to um, explain all story of Spundus and Piper, not only our work in breeding grounds, but also um, tell local people about um, um, what is going uh, with Spundus and Piper in different countries and also how um, people live in different countries, because it's also a new and interesting information for, for many of um, local people. Uh, and um, Spoonbus and Piper, as I told, Spoonbus and Piper is breeding not far from the coast, uh, within the belt of six kilometers uh, average. Uh, and uh, this is the same area where the most uh, local settlement uh, are located. And uh, uh, so um, the same area where uh, red salmon comes for spawning, the same area where local people come in, uh, with their reindeer. So it's a lot of um, activities uh, uh, and we assume it is a very important to have part of this territory protected. Uh, and um, we offer to um, organize a nature park, the land of Spoonbills and Piper. Uh, <clears throat> and now the um, uh, Chukotka government um, um, discussing this project and hopefully it will, um, it, it will come to reality, uh, real life um, and, and uh, this territory will be protected. Uh, one of a new project in our expedition, it's a um, uh, genome study, a uh, study genome of Spoonbus and Piper by um, um, Professor Kandrashov from Barcelona, Vienna. Uh, and um, uh, this um, uh, project also um, gave us an interesting result. We found um, out that um, 2,000 years ago, Spoonbus and Piper was very numerous, very, very much numerous, and its population number was dozens of thousands. So not, not just uh, that meters um, lower than now, uh, and the Dorigian Bridge, and the Beringian Bridge was exist. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this provided additional vast areas uh, with potential habitats for the Spoonbills and Piper near the coast uh, of uh, modern Chukotka, um, modern lines of Chukotka and Alaska. We also have some GIS uh, habitat evaluation made by our colleague uh, from UK and by our own uh, Russian colleague. Uh, but um, this is um, only beginning of uh, big work. Uh, and actually this um, project shown some potential um, breeding habitats even in Alaska um, and um, taking into account some uh, more or less modern sightings of um, Spoonbills and Piper not far from Alaska. And um, mm, uh, quite similar breeding habitat uh, in Alaska. As you can see, this uh, sorry, uh, this speed. Uh, as if, if you remember the speed, the Chukotka speed at the beginning of my talk, you can see. Oh, sorry. Uh, so this is quite similar speed in Alaska, uh, and um, we have a joint pro 
project with um, our um, colleague from Alaska, uh, try to search for Spundus and Piper there, but we um, didn't find it uh, yet. But um, so maybe next time, maybe in future, who knows? <laughs> this is uh, also a very interesting project for us. Um, so I think my time is um, more or less over. Uh, and uh, I will tell much more about our international collaboration next time. Uh, but I also uh, want to what I also want to add that um, all result I um, tell you today is not only my result or uh, my with Evgeny, but uh, this is a result of the work of very big international and Russian team, many people and um, many many years. Uh, uh, and uh, weeks and days. Uh, so um, I'm very thankful for all my colleagues who provide all this data for me and um, make possible um, for me to share this result with you. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much for a fascinating presentation. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just so interesting to learn about, uh, about this critically endangered species. Uh, that I know many people are keen to see, but uh, what a what a very special little bird it is indeed. Mm -hmm. um, I see that Zhenya uh, uh, has um, has joined us, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so welcome, welcome Zhenya. Thank you for uh, being with us, um, even though you haven't participated in your presentation. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for being here. Um, there are a couple of questions, um, if I can just go through those. The, the, the first, a very general one, what do these birds feed on? Oh, as the most of wade is feed on a variety of, um, uh, of insects. Uh, and um, uh, when uh, the project has started, is going, um, it um, uh, usually people um, add some artificial food, dry food, but um, then um, most of food um, uh, alive, like mosquitoes, like some invertebrates from water. Uh, and so this is a food for, uh, for breeding grounds. But in wintering areas, um, um, uh, Scumbus and Piper is often uh, fed by cr little crabs and uh, some other mm, invertebrates in, um, in water. And so why he used this mm, a bit of pumping using his unique uh, bill. Great, thanks very much. And then there are a couple of questions that relate to, uh, well, the first one, um, just in terms of research, uh, breeding, breeding biology research, are predators known to follow the scent of researchers to nests that are being studied? And I guess a, a follow-on from that is, if that is the case, what is done to try and uh, to try and mitigate this? You mean the predators can follow their uh, the researchers? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, of course, uh, uh, especially uh, we, we know it for a raven because uh, we, uh, we um, know it's especially watch the researcher and try to, uh, to see the nest. Uh, so we, we try to avoid it. We are not coming close to the nest when we see any predators around. Um, and uh, we sometimes try to regulate them, um, the number of uh, predators uh, in vicinity of the nest. Uh, and um, uh, also, uh, when people uh, growing them, um, dealing with the spoonbills and piper chicks, they have kind of uh, training courses for chicks because when they, for example, when they come with them um, uh, dog, domestic dog, they um, make type recording of alarming call of uh, adult birds. They actually made a lot of um, audio sounds. Uh, uh, for for these little chicks grown in captivity, so they try to, um, to use the same skills as they are um, the same birds using in uh, in nature. But that's, we could uh, not, but we could not uh, really regulate. Uh, we couldn't make um, all our area clean from predators be first because mm. this is um, uh, this is um, um, vicinity of village. 
uh, and uh, also sec and, we, and we can have many dogs around. Uh, and second, because uh, if we clean the territory from one predator, so just next one can come from the additional uh, uh, from the nearest territory and um, start um, doing the same. Uh, so uh, luckily, this is the area which is very rich in um, red salmon. So uh, some predators just change to red salmon. Some predators change to ground squirrels. So it's uh, sometimes often also a uh, different condition from uh, year to year. Thank you. Another question just relates to imprinting on your, your captive bred birds. Um, do the chicks imprint on humans? I did see, you know, and you showed a picture of, of the, uh, the people working there wearing white so mm -hmm. as to, uh, you know, to look different to other human beings that, uh, that the birds would come into contact with. Are there any other measures? Firstly, do they imprint on humans and what measures uh, are, are taken to try and uh, ensure that this doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, first, um, uh, these uh, spoonbills and pipe chicks, uh, like most of way the chicks, then they are quite, how to say, low in the in imprinting, not like geese, chicks, uh, uh, and other um, birds, like, like crane chicks. Uh, so they maybe uh, for some period, they assume people providing food for them, but they forget about it. And when they are very small and stay in rooms, uh, they not um, uh, see people because so it's all, always, um, how to say, the cover, uh, cover in between chicks and people. So chicks um, could not see people, even providing the food because it just appears, some plates of food, uh, no people. Uh, and of course, nobody play with chicks, no, they never take them in hands. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in aviaries, outdoors, um, uh, as I told, people try to wear these special strange white costumes, sometimes with the hat, so they try to, um, to make this um, a bit different from um, uh, ordinary people, or ordinary people, from, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And then just, uh, I see there's another uh, question just about uh, feeding the chicks. What you mentioned that uh, food is provided, obviously, but what, what is the food that is provided for chicks? In I the captive, in the aviaries. Yes, yes. I do not remember the exact name of the food, but it's quite um, a usual food for waders, which use in um, um, WWT. But I remember one uh, story. Try to be short, but it's interesting story for the. So first uh, year we start this project uh, uh, and uh, try to provide this artificial dry food to chicks, which we need to put into the water. And chick uh, doesn't take it from the very early days, and it is very important. For, um, for us um, to, to start feed them from the early beginning because they're tiny, little, and need to, to eat a lot. Uh, so, uh, but they're very good to ta um, uh, in taking um, moving food. So we provide them some mosquitoes, but this territory of Mainopilgina, it's on the coastal area with a lot of wind and um, luckily there is no mosquitoes, luckily for people, luckily for everybody, but not for spoonbills and piper chicks. So people need to come to uh, Tundra uh, further, maybe 10 kilometers in a bush and try to collect mosquitoes there with a um, special modern vacuum cleaner with a glass um, to collect them all alive and then bring this mosquito in semi-live conditions and they provided them, them as a food. So uh, so for them, but after two days, uh, chicks start um, feeding successfully and then change to this artificial food. It's not totally artificial. I mean, it's not natural. It's dry food, but it's made from some natural parcels. Um, it's a, now it's a good addition. But um, in our days, people um, try to add as much as possible natural food. So they collect mosquitoes and they collect invertebrates in from the nearest lake, uh, so to provide as much as possible natural food. Thank you very much. I think that's uh, all the questions here. I don't know about on, on Facebook, Itosa. Wow, what a, what a labor intensive uh, work this is. Mm -hmm. um, incredible efforts being, being made to uh, try and ensure the survival uh, of, uh, of this wonderful bird species. Um, 
Lena, thank you very, very much once again for this wonderful presentation. And a number of people have commented saying they can't wait for uh, for the next presentation. So thank you very we, much. We, we look forward to uh, to hearing the third part of uh, of the series next week. Um, thank you very much. Have, yes, the, wonderful to told, have had you with us. Thank you very much. As I told, it's not on uh, my walk. Uh, only my walk is a walk of very uh, big group. And, uh, I will try to do my best uh, to present the next part of our lectures about school visit Piper. Thank you very much. Well, from this from this small community, our, our, our heartfelt con uh, congratulations to the research team, the whole group. I think this is a wonderful story and uh, lovely that you're sharing it with us. So mm -hmm. we really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, any, any further comments uh, from anybody before we uh, wrap up for this evening? Les, would you like to say a few words? Oh, I think we've been uh, privileged tonight to have uh, two remarkable presentations. And uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Rosie and, and Kuria. And thanks, um, Lena and Genia and your, um, and your enormous team. You know, as a researcher myself, myself I know that, um, that it's teamwork. And you might be the face up in front, but um, a lot of people behind you, and I feel the same uh, same way too. So I second your, your comments about uh, mm -hmm. teamwork. Yeah. So thank you.